Hello, and welcome to Linux Action News, episode 271, recorded on December 14th, 2022. I'm Chris. And I'm Wes. Hello, Wes. Let's do the news. Way back in December 2020, if you can remember that far, Calabra announced a Wayland driver for Wine. At the time, Wayland used its X11 driver to interface with the display server. That setup worked on Wayland, but it adds complexity and possible inefficiencies. It would really be ideal if Wine could just talk directly to Wayland, if only someone would do the work. Well, Alexandros Francis decided to take that challenge on. And take it on, they did. Two years later, things are going from good to great. On the Collabora blog, they have a new post that highlights some of the work over this last year. This is kind of becoming an annual tradition. Towards the end of the year, we get one of these posts. And this year, it focuses a lot on the work that went into making wine gaming just absolutely fantastic on Wayland. But it actually goes beyond just games and covers some essential desktop apps as well. Yeah, we got to say, Chrome and Chromium-based apps, those are right on the top of the list. A significant improvement was actually just recently added to support cross-process rendering. Chrome is also now supported without any special flags and is entirely GPU-accelerated on both OpenGL and Vulkan. Yeah, if you've seen something like Dash Dash, I can't remember exactly, but it's like Dash Dash Process something after your Chrome executable in your process list, that's essentially their workaround for this missing capability that just going to be baked in now and then chrome could just start like any old regular application and other things that are based on chromium but long term there's also some work that collabor is doing so that way desktop compositors can take advantage of some tooling to communicate about optional formats about the screen modifiers like maybe it rotated maybe it's in tablet mode you know that kind of information that it's good for the application running and of course if the compositor is aware of any of that information if it could relay it to a running application so that application can respond then that's just a better experience for the end user that groundwork has been laid in there now and uh, of course we just need the other side of the work to get done on the compositor side gosh all these recent changes really makes one wonder how good could windows app and game compatibility how, how good could that be in a couple more years you know i mean Thinking about the last five or ten years, it's it's come a long way already. And a little more polish, I think we could get that, that next set of people ready to switch to Linux. Linus released Linux 6.1 this week, and the big headline feature is the initial support for the Rust programming language. But initial is really the key word there. Indeed, it really is a basic implementation at this stage. There's actually nothing but test code that's actually shipping. We haven't seen something like a GPU driver or file system written in Rust actually make it to the mainline kernel. At least, not quite yet. No, but we do believe both a file system and GPU Rust driver are in development. And we've even heard Linus voice support for a file system driver or some other system driver as a good place to start with Rust because it's relatively isolated from the rest of the kernel. And so in that sense, it kind of makes a great starting point. There's so many great updates in 6.1 for just everyday devices. The PinePhone keyboard driver, that chips in there. Um, the fancy Xbox controller driver, that chips in there. There's like a whole bunch of hardware from really cool new processor features, new video card features, um, game controller stuff. It's just nice to see all this stuff kind of land for everyday folk out there. And the kernel got a new superpower as well. It is now capable of decompressing and launching itself independent of the hardware architecture it's on, at least on EFI systems. For some reason, that excites me. I don't, I don't know quite how yet, but surely some KXEC madness to come. There's also some significant I.O. Euring performance improvements in 6.1. And... It looks like 6.1 is on target to end up as the next LTS kernel, or at least there's a pretty good chance, which probably makes 6.1 a kernel we'll be talking about for years to come. I think so. And so with 6.1 out, that means the, quote, merge window from hell has opened up. At least that's what Linus calls it, because, of course, this cycle is just 
before the holidays or perhaps just right on the holidays. And like many of us, Linus has some holiday travel to do as well. So that'll be challenging. It sure will. It looks like Linux 6.2 will have its stocking stuffed full of features as well. First and foremost, at least for us, a stable version of Intel's Arc graphics driver should end up in 6.2, along with uh, more support for Apple hardware. Yeah, it seems like we're seeing that Apple hardware support every single release. And all right, that's great. Let's just keep building towards that. They also solved a so-called tasty target for attackers. I wouldn't be surprised if this gets backported. Uh, It refers to work that's gone into some new patches for Linux 6.2's memory management, at least on x86 systems. It's based on work discovered by a Google researcher, and they found that the CPU entry area, that's a piece of per-CPU data that is mapped into user space page tables, well, it wasn't subject to any randomization, irrespective of what the kernel address space layout randomization settings were. Now, the work to actually solve that problem and add in some randomization on the per-CPU entry areas has been done, and that was contributed by developers at Intel, and that is ready to go in 6.2. And perhaps a little less appealing, the driver to support Intel's software-defined silicon, now known as Intel On Demand, well, it's getting an update in 6.2. In addition to updating that branding and a few new features, Most notably, it's getting metered support ready for what they call the consumption activation model. Oh, great. Well, coming to a Xeon near you, and then who knows from where after that, or two. Uh, There is some good news, though, in 6.2 still. It's not all bad news. Um, ModderFS users, you're getting a big performance improvement and reliability improvements to ButterFS's native RAID 5 and RAID 6 mode. They're starting to talk very serious about their RAID 5 and RAID 6 improvements. That's good to see. And you can rest assured, we'll dig more into that as it gets closer. The Alma Linux team received a big vote of confidence from a significant industry player this week. CERN, the European Center for Nuclear Research, based in Switzerland, and the Fermi National Accelerator Laboratory, or Fermilab, based in Illinois, both said they would offer Alma Linux as the standard Linux distribution for experiments in their labs. The organization said in a joint statement, quote, Alma Linux has recently been gaining traction among the community due to its long life cycle for each major version, extended architecture support, rapid release cycle, and upstream community contributions and support for security advisory metadata. They go on to say in testing, it is demonstrated to be perfectly compatible with other rebuilds of Red Hat Enterprise Linux. Now, like all complex real-world networks, there are other versions of Linux in use, including a limited number of RHEL and CentOS servers, and those will probably remain in production for a couple of years to come. Well, that's kind of understandable. Um, <laughs> they're not going to switch overnight. I bet if you looked hard enough, you'd also find some Seuss and Debian in there too. At least from what some little birdies have told me. Uh, But if you just kind of go by the headline here, just their recommendation, just saying this is the one we're going behind, this is the one we recommend, that has significant implications for the scientific community. And it does seem like a great fit from an organizational structure standpoint on Alma's side and the goals of the scientific community. And they say in their joint announcement that they came to this conclusion based on the particular requirements and researcher feedback. So it seems there was some demand from Alma from their local community as well. The GNU Compiler Collection, or GCC for short, the popular free software compiler system, has added support for the Rust programming language. Now, the GCC Rust front end, as it's known, provides preliminary support for Rust, and it's now been merged into the GCC 13 code base. That's kind of great. Although it'll likely take until the next stable release of GCC 13 for most users to get their hands on this, and that's expected to be in March or April of next year, 2023, in the form of GCC 13.1. And just to continue to temper your expectations, we gotta note that this new front end is still very early in development, and it's gonna take some time before it's fully functional and feature complete. Like, for instance, 
Rust's famous memory safety feature, the borrow checker, that has yet to be implemented. So that kind of gives you an idea of how far along this is. But despite those limitations, I think the addition of Rust support to GCC in general, it's a big step forward. And it's really nice to have an alternative implementation to the official LLVM-based compiler. Linode.com slash LAN. That's where you go to get $100 in 60-day credit on a new account. And it's a great way to support the show while you're checking out fast, reliable cloud hosting with the best support in the business. Real humans all day, every day. Not chatbots. Real human beings. And Linode is 30 to 50% cheaper than the hyperscalers that are out there with their crazy platforms and their crazy terms that want to lock you in an upsell every turn you make. It's ridiculous. Linode doesn't play that game. The game that they're playing is good product, good support, good documentation, great dashboard, an API for days, and 11 data centers around the world for you to choose from, with another dozen coming on next year. I am passionate, passionate about Linode three years into being a customer. I love it. I love the performance, I love the flexibility, and I love the support. So go build something, go learn something, try it for yourself, and support the show. Linode's what we use, and I know you're going to love it. So go get 100 bucks and try it out. Linode.com slash LAN. And thank you to Collide. Collide is an endpoint security solution that uses the most powerful untapped resource in IT, end users. When you're trying to achieve security goals, whether a third-party audit or your own compliance standards, the conventional wisdom is to treat every device like Fort Knox. Old school device management tools like MDMs force disruptive agents onto employee devices that slow performance and treat privacy as an afterthought. That way of doing things turns IT admins and end users into enemies and creates its own security problems because users turn to shadow IT just to do their jobs. Collide does things differently. Instead of forcing changes on users, Collide sends them security recommendations via Slack. Clyde will automatically notify your team when their devices are insecure and give them step-by-step instructions on how to solve the problem. By reaching out to employees via a friendly Slack DM and educating them about company policies, Clyde can help you build a culture in which everyone contributes to security because everyone understands how and why to do it. For IT admins, Clyde provides a single dashboard that lets you monitor the security of your entire fleet, whether they're running on Mac, Windows, or Linux. You can see at a glance which employees have their disks encrypted, OS up-to-date, and password manager installed, making it easy to prove compliance to your auditors, customers, and leadership. So, that's Collide. User-centered, cross-platform endpoint security for teams that slack. You can meet your compliance goals by putting users first, Visit collide.com slash LAN to find out how. If you follow that link, they'll hook you up with a goodie bag, including a t-shirt, just for activating a free trial. That's K-O-L-I-D-E dot com slash LAN. The PeerTube team announced version 5 this week, which they say is the result of five years of handcrafted development. If you don't remember... PeerTube is a decentralized, federated alternative to YouTube. And some of the new features they're highlighting in version 5 is private and internal video files. And they're now more secure than they were previously, held a little bit differently on the file system, and there's better authentication checks as well. There is a migration script you'll have to use if you have private videos, so watch out for that. Also, they've introduced and expanded object storage support. In the last version, we got object storage support for uploaded stored videos. Now they've introduced object storage support for live streams, which is a fantastic feature for us because that's how we use it. And lovely to see two-factor authentication landing as well. I'm sure if you do have a lot of private videos, that'll be especially nice to see. There's also a few other improvements to the user experience generally, like a better indication of live streams when they're happening, and some fixes to network issues in the video player. This new version also introduces a new studio feature, which lets you do some light video editing uh, and replay publications if you want a Twitch-like livestream experience. 
Peer Tube 5 also comes with the usual set of bug fixes and improvements we've come to expect, including some nice API endpoint improvements that the developers say should enable Peer Tube contributors to develop an even more powerful set of future plugins. And, and something that stood out to me, some nice updates to their open telemetry documentation, which should make it much simpler if you want to use tools like Prometheus and Grafana to monitor your peer tube. Actually, that is kind of nice. We've been a little unhappy with some of the metric tracking at times with peer tube so far. So it'd be nice just to have that second set of data analytics. I gave this upgrade a go on our Jupyter.tube instance, and well, <laughs> there have been a few issues on the admin side. I've opened uh, a bug about that. And I think maybe we have a few problems with some of our pages not showing any videos, even though there's videos on the system. I'd be curious if our listeners could give us feedback on that because I'm coming from a cache system. I'm logged in all the time. I'd like to know uh, what the experience for them is like on Jupyter.tube right now. Yeah, we should call out here that there are some minor but breaking changes included in the 5.0 release. Before you upgrade, definitely go over to their GitHub release page where they've got some instructions documented. It's not a big deal. They give you a command to run which has Docker-specific instructions if you're doing it that way like we are. Uh, there's also a configuration file update that you need to do manually. But take care of that first. Should have an easy time. Yeah, yeah, as long as... As long as you do it before the upgrade, it should be really smooth. Don't ask me how I know. Uh, I, I do hope, though, that the overall polish and feature set of PeerTube 5.0 will start to draw the eye of Linux and open source events and projects to use PeerTube because it's, it's basically a open source YouTube platform in a box. It does the channel stuff. You can upload videos. You can even import videos from YouTube into it directly. And of course, it does the live streaming. And I think having used it on and off for a couple of years, and now we're using it consistently multiple times a week, it could easily address the need of most fast expos and projects. Just the open source community could be embracing this, I think, in a lot bigger way. And it just seems like such a natural fit and a great way for us to help contribute to decentralizing video distribution on the web. We should note here that uh, for the past five years, PeerTube has really only had one developer directly dedicated to it. There's also a small team of volunteers at Framasoft that sort of get together and release one new major version per year, all of that funded solely by user contributions. Yes. In fact, we'll put a link to that in the show notes because I think this is definitely a project worth keeping an eye on. And we will do just that as well as an eye on everything else going on in the world of Linux and open source. So don't miss an episode. Go to linuxactionnews.com slash subscribe for all the ways to get each release. And linuxactionnews.com slash contact for ways to get in touch. And just for a little longer, we have a special promo at jupiter.party, the membership program that supports all the show and gets them all for you ad-free, including this here Linux Action News. Just use the promo code 2022 to take $2 off the monthly subscription for the lifetime of the subscription. That's promo code 2022 at jupiter.party. As for us, we'll be partying on right here next week with our take on the latest Linux and open source news. Thanks for joining us. And that's all the news for this week. 